the subject of soft power, of course, is um, and Chinese soft power, um, and I should say that not just the subject of it, but the question, does China have soft power? I think we have to start there. And it's gaining increased attention um, both inside and outside of China in the last uh, couple of, of years. There's been a rather dramatic rise in publications. I haven't seen your, I've heard of your new book is coming out by Paul Grave Macmillan. I have to get a hold of a copy, but um, there have been a miniature sort of cottage industry and explosion can you hear me in the back, by the way? It's okay. Um, uh, there's been a rather um, miniature explosion of writing about Chinese soft power in the last sort of two, three years since the Olympics, the Shanghai Expo, uh, and so on. Uh, so the world is now interested in this subject. The Chinese are similarly preoccupied with it. Um, they are now increasingly aware of the role that image plays in uh, international relations and in their own foreign policy and the role that soft power um, could play potentially in their foreign policy. So the Chinese have been asking themselves, how do we get it? Uh, why don't we have it? Um, what should we do with it if we can get it? <laughs> um, it's not something you can go to a store and buy, you know, off the shelf. And so there's a lot of uh, very animated um, discussions inside of China, which I'll talk about in a second, um, on this subject. I should say there's much more interest inside of China than outside of China on this subject. But let me just start with a couple of slides, very uh, recent slides, <coughs> excuse me, that um, kind of illustrate the dichotomies of this subject. What you're looking at first here is Times Square, of course, New York, uh, about a week ago. Um, during Hu Jintao's recent visit to the United States. The Shanghai, not the Shanghai, the State Council Information Office, the Guoxin Ban of the State Council, um, purchased um, time on the screens on the left and aired uh, for several days a series of um, images about China, cultural images, Yao Ming, other, other things. And um, the, let's see, is it the Xinhua News Agency actually it's reported is going to have a 24-7 uh, uh, screen in Times Square of, for their new channel. I'll get to this in the talk tonight too, but they have now a 24-7 replica of Al Jazeera or CNN uh, that they are beaming worldwide off of different satellites. The coverage in North America is actually not that good. They just signed a contract recently to try and boost it. Um, but they have plans to put a large screen in Times Square. Anyway, that's one image of a week ago. The Chinese attempt to um, display uh, their country um, and their culture uh, right here in the heart of the United States. Um, this is another image uh, very recently. The empty chair of Nobel Pri Peace Prize winner Liu Xiaobo in Oslo last month. Of course, uh, this year's recipient, unable to attend and receive his award because he is serving an 11-year prison sentence in the Liaoning prison for subversion of state power, so-called. Uh, so uh, that, I think, exemplifies some of the difficulties that China has in, uh, in projecting its soft power, these two slides. So they're trying, I'm just trying to start the presentation with a couple of images that uh, show you um, both the efforts but the deficits um, in this area. Now to be sure the Chinese leadership has um, taken note of the question of soft power. Here of course is President Hu Jintao who was in uh, the United States last week um, giving his, his State of the Union address uh, which they do every four years in China at the uh, 17th Party Congress back in 2008. Uh, and you can read the quotation there uh, for yourself. Um, we must enhance culture as part of the soft power in our country. We'll further publicize the fine traditions of Chinese culture and strengthen international cultural exchanges to enhance the influence of Chinese culture uh, worldwide. <coughs> uh, Premier Wen Jiabao has given similar speeches about the importance of soft uh, power recently. 
Other Politburo members, Lee Chang Chun in particular, because he's in charge of propaganda, um, others have spoken about this. So the Chinese leadership has um, certainly taken note and uh, has approved uh, the allocation of rather significant resources into this whole sphere of soft power building and public diplomacy, which, by the way, are not, are not the same uh, things. Um, so let's first just uh, remind ourselves what we're talking about here t tonight, or this afternoon, uh, when we're talking about soft power. A uh, few definitional uh, items first. Now we have to start, of course, with the father of soft power, uh, Joe Nye, Joseph Nye from Harvard, um, who in his various writings, he has a brand new book out, by the way, I was just reading on the airplane coming out here yesterday, called The Nature of Power, or The Shape of Power, something about power, um, brand new. Uh, but his other writings on soft power D uh, described that it's the ability to shape preferences of others, to get others to want the outcomes that you want. <coughs> and he argues that behavior can be affected through threats, inducements, or attraction. Um, and of course, soft power is the latter, and it is to be distinguished, obviously, from hard power, which is the former. Um, so uh, soft power relies on co-optation rather than coercion. Uh, and it's the intrinsic ability of a country to attract others to it. Uh, and as such, Nye says, soft power grows out of a country's culture, values, and foreign policies. So it's highly normative in nature. That's what we're talking about here. I've always sort of thought of it like a magnet that uh, you know, attracts others uh, to it for its intrinsic strength. Um, it's the capacity of a society to attract others rather than the capacity of a government to persuade others. So there's a very important definition that is blurred frequently in Western writings, but even more so in Chinese writings, between soft power, which originates from society and is attractive, and public diplomacy, which originates from government and is proactive, uh, going out to try and persuade other publics, not to mention one's own public, of a given uh, set of policies. Okay, so um, to be sure, public diplomacy can enhance soft power and vice versa. But without intrinsic soft power, public diplomacy is reduced to little more than state propaganda, I would submit. So no matter how well resourced by governments, if the message is not sellable, the messenger cannot sell it. And this is China's soft power dilemma, in my view. They've got real problems with the message. They got lots of messengers, and they're very well resourced, um, but they have real difficulty um, explaining their messages and getting them across in digestible ways to foreign audiences. Okay, so these are just sort of uh, some things to bear in mind definitionally as we uh, talk about this subject uh, tonight. Okay, so um, the discussion tonight is about China's global image as well. So let's um, talk about that for a second. Uh, we see, I'm sorry, here are some definitions of uh, public diplomacy as distinct from soft power. While you're digesting that, let me s say a few words about uh, China's global image. Um, there are different institutions in the world, of course, that measure uh, different countries' global images um, on a fairly regular basis, the most ex important of which is the Pew um, uh, Foundation. Um, but also the Pew Research Center, I should say. Uh, BBC does a number of these. Clay mentioned a minute ago the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, which is the one that I was involved with, with a soft power study, but the Chicago Council does a series of regular um, surveys of uh, America's image in the world that are really excellent. Uh, the Lowy Institute in Sydney, Australia, uh, is very well known. A Gallup you know, a lot of people are in this, um, in this business. So when those that look at China um, and have been trying to uh, discuss, this slide's gonna be very hard for you to see, I apologize for that, but um, this is the most recent uh, BBC um, poll that was done um, uh, this summer, this past summer. Anyway, 
if you look at all these polls in terms of China's global image uh, over the last few years, you notice a couple of things. First, um, that China's image is mixed at best on a global basis. Certain regions of the world, it's better uh, than others. Africa, consistently strong. Uh, but everywhere else, Middle East, Central Asia, Latin America, East Asia, South Asia, North America, and certainly Europe, um, mixed to poor. That's the first thing you know. So China's image is mixed, with the exception of Africa. Um, second thing you notice in these polls is that since 2008, for sure, in some cases, uh, in the case of Europe, for example, 2006, there has been a precipitous decline in China's global image, um, which, uh, has, which continues, uh, which continues, actually. So this slide shows you, if I can find it, China is down, yeah. Um, the yellow are mainly negative uh, views, and the blue are mainly positive views. So down on the bottom, where you see longer blue bars, that's the longest blue bar is China, China's own view of itself, OK? <laughs> uh, the next longest blue bar is Pakistan, followed by the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, Azerbaijan, um, Australia, and South Korea. Um, but all the long yellow bars are other parts of the world. Latin America at the top, Europe is kind of that second cluster, and uh, Middle East Africa in the center. So um, as I say, mixed at best, but not terribly good. Now this one is also unfortunately hard for you to see, certainly in the back, but this brown line is China from 2005 to 2010. So you've seen the kind of precipitous decline, 34% favorability ratings uh, over time. Not good. Only uh, Iraq, North Korea, um, let's see, Russia, and Israel and Iran rank worse than China. <coughs> Not good company to be in. Okay, um, so, but you know, so despite the mixed, generally mixed nature and the uh, decline over time of the last two or three years, these data uh, nonetheless do show that China has what you might call pockets of favorability in certain places, as I say, largely in Africa, Palestinian territories, a couple of other uh, places. But overall, uh, China's got a real image problem. That's the main point. And their government knows they have an image problem. And they are very concerned about it and troubled uh, by it. Um, and trying to do, trying to understand it and do something about it. And they are putting, as I say, huge resources, financial resources uh, into it. Uh, the same way I would argue they do when they want to start high-speed rail or anything else in China. They just throw resources at it, thinking you can basically buy it or invest, investment will produce return, right? So you invest, you'll get the return. Well, that's an interesting hypothesis that we are going to have to test in this case of soft power. So they're doing these things in Times Square. They're setting up, I'm going to go through tonight, a lot of examples of, of um, Chinese attempts to broaden soft power, some government-led, some not, more societal-led. Um, but the jury is out as to whether uh, the investment is paying dividends yet. We don't, it's too early uh, to say. Um, but I would say there's this sort of kind of mentality about how to go out and acquire soft power, something that Chinese government at least, and I've talked to a number of the people in the State Council Information Office and other propaganda department, the overseas propaganda, the Dui Wai Shenshan Lingdao Shaozu Bureau that is in charge of this, and they all think, okay, we we have, we have a lot of values that are universal. Um, others will love us, we, and they're really confused. Why don't foreigners love us? You know, why can't they see uh, the intrinsic value of our society and our um, country? So they're really perplexed. Chinese officials and, and people and intellectuals are, are genuinely perplexed about why they have such a mixed international image, because they think they mean well, and why shouldn't everybody just love us?
Well, it's not so easy. Americans think we mean well. Why don't other people love us? Well, we've had 50 years as a superpower to experience in this country. We know that it comes with being a superpower. It also comes with certain policies, externally and internally. That's why I showed you the empty chair in Oslo. Okay, <laughs> um, okay so let's uh, come now to the question of China's own soft power discourse. As I mentioned at the outset, this is uh, an increasingly um, uh, subject of, of a very increasing interest ever since Hu Jintao's 17th Party Congress speech uh, back in 2007, right? Um, so you can see there in the bar graphs, uh, the left-hand side are academic journals, right-hand side are newspapers, um, that basically it just takes off in 2007, and then for some reason, and I don't understand why, it tails off in 2009. This is just a crude indicator of the number of articles published um, in academic journals versus newspapers uh, per year. But it gives you a sense of the uh, interest in this subject known as Ron Shirley. Um, now, uh, it's not just people writing about it. Whole departments or uh, universities are now being devoted to it, um, to the study of public diplomacy, I should say, uh, not so much soft power. And that's, the, that's another thing. In China, soft power is embedded within public diplomacy. That's part of the problem. They, don't, they think of it as the same thing. They think that if the state just gets involved and can market itself through public diplomacy, then China's image will improve. But as I tried at the beginning to say to you, there's a fundamental distinction between the attraction of a society and a proactive propaganda of a government or proactive policies of public diplomacy, some of which is propagandistic, some of which is not. Okay, uh, anyway, there are now public diplomacy departments being established in a number of universities. There's a brand new journal on public diplomacy, Gong Gong Wai Jiao, published by the Chinese People's Political Consultative Congress. A couple of issues have just emerged. Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, established last year a whole department on public diplomacy. And I had a lot of discussions with them, in fact, about when I was living in Beijing about what they should be doing. And they're looking around for ideas, and they're indeed studying what other countries, foreign ministries, public diplomacy departments do. Um, but they, they're sort of an organization in search of a mission. They've got a budget, but you know, they're um, still working on how to spend it. There's a museum of public diplomacy in uh, eastern Beijing, in fact. So there's been a real uptick uh, in interest on soft power and uh, public diplomacy articles, uh, too. And now, so what does one find in this discourse? Uh, when Chinese write about their own soft power or soft power deficits, um, three uh, subjects, or th it breaks down into three basic schools, I find. I spent a lot of time reading all these hundreds of articles uh, over the last year. And I find they break down into three uh, uh, camps, three schools. First of all, the most important one, culture is the essence of Chinese soft power. Um, this is widely shared amongst almost all scholars, observers, journalists, and certainly the government. The view here is that China's great history and civilization is the heart of its soft power. Um, many Chinese think that uh, China has values from traditional civilization that are indeed universal um, and can be exported. Which values? De, mor uh, mor morality, he, harmony, li, ritual, and ren, benevolence. These are the big four. <laughs> all Chinese, or not all Chinese, most Chinese say, you know, this is what distinguishes us, and others will, if we can just get this out, others will understand the essence of Chinese culture. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, the culture school, that soft, the heart of soft power for China is culture, is the predominant school. Second school is the economic school that argues that um, China's economic development of the last 30 years has produced a unique so-called China model, the Zhongguo Moshe, or Mofa. Um, and particularly in the wake of the global financial crisis, they are increasingly convinced of their China model of development and increasingly convinced of the failure of the Western model of development. 
So there's lots and lots of writing and debate. I'm not trying to say it's all the same. In fact, there are debates about what actually constitutes the Chinese economic model. But um, that's the second big school. There's a third school, which is definitely a minority school, but it's the political school. That is to say that China's political system uh, is an element of its soft power. And there are scholars uh, who argue that it's really the Chinese Communist Party's adaptability, <laughs> about which I wrote this book a couple years ago, uh, and um, you know the Zhongguo Tesu, the Chinese characteristics that are unique to China and that really uh, these characteristics are a key component of China's overall soft power and should appeal to other developing countries. So the domestic discourse breaks down, I would crudely argue, into these three uh, broad camps. Okay. Um, okay, now let me move to indicators of China's soft power. Um, so here are listed a number of them um, that, uh, the, actually these are not so much indicators of soft power as of China's global cultural presence. But if Joseph Nye would count many of these things as part of a country's soft power, it's history and civilization, literature, art, film, education and research, tourism, sports, global brands, and foreign aid and investment. So these are instruments in the soft power toolbox, if you will, for any country uh, and for China increasingly. So let's um, walk uh, through these. Clearly the first um, uh, and the most important of all in, uh, instrument in the soft power toolbox is history and civilization, the 3,000 years of of um, China's uh, very proud uh, and long civilization, inventions, uh, and so on. And we have seen this highlighted in the Olympic Games, we've seen this highlighted in the Shanghai Expo, we see this highlighted everywhere. This is front and center. Uh, this is who we are, China. Um, now this is very interesting for a government that for many years rejected China's past <laughs> and attacked it viciously. Um, try to bury it, quite literally, you know, um, during the Cultural Revolution, but even pre-Cultural Revolution and post-Cultural Revolution. In other words, the embrace by the Chinese Communist Party of China's past is very, very recent. Last decade, really, or a little bit more than. Um, it's been highlighted, as I say, in the Olympic Games and other places, but um, better late than never. So there's been a lot of restoration of monasteries and temples and traditional sites uh, in China, um, some of them designated UNESCO World Heritage Sites, um, and so on. So this is the, uh, the main uh, instrument in soft power uh, toolbox. Uh, what about uh, literature? Oh, and I should say on the history and civilization, um, a lot of what China does is to send abroad these um, delegations and, and mount these festivals and year, years of China in different countries and, um, and China, <coughs> year of China festivals in uh, different cities. Washington has one every year. Um, they are mounted by the Ministry of Culture who is a very key actor in this whole soft power business and the current minister himself, Tsai Wu, is a very important actor. He gets it. He understands the importance of soft power from his previous career in diplomacy and in the party. Uh, and he's trying to make the Ministry of Culture much more than an uh, organization that maintains museums inside of China. He's trying to make the Ministry of Culture a very proactive organization on the world stage. But even Tsai Wu laments some of these uh, years, these exhibitions abroad. Um, he, he's, uh, interviewed him a couple times for this and he said concerning these exhibitions, he says, the annual income of China's overseas commercial performances has not reached a hundred million dollars, which is even less than one single popular foreign circus. They're heavily subsidized by the state. They don't make any money, um, but uh, they um, feel it's important to, to do them. So everywhere you travel, in Europe, um, Asia, the United States, Latin America increasingly, you find these 
exhibitions. Okay, what about liter literature? Um, key element of any country's intellectual soft power, to be sure. Uh, Chinese fiction writers have become quite well known abroad in recent years, many of them being translated uh, into foreign languages, including English. Um, you're familiar with a number of these authors, I'm sure. Zhang Rong, very, you know, Wolf Totem, Gao Xing Jin, Ha Jin, Han Han, Xinran, Moyan, Yu Hua, and others. Um, have become very acclaimed authors here in the United States, in fact. Uh, ha Jin has enjoyed very widespread appeal and for a number of his books. Han Han was included in Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people for 2010 uh, this year. And Kaohsiung Jin, of course, is the recipient of the Nobel Prize for Literature, but after he left China. <laughs> so this is something Chinese lament. They don't win Nobel Prizes for anything. Well, they have a Nobel Prize now, uh -huh. Nobel Peace Prize, the most coveted of all Nobel Prizes. Um, uh, but they haven't won uh, Nobel Prizes in the sciences, interestingly enough, um, or in the humanities. Uh, yet, it's just a matter of time, but not yet. I've actually done a, another, another study looking at the sciences, but um, so uh, literature um, is an example of China's increasing reach into foreign uh, cultures. Um, right, you know, right into your Barnes and Noble down the street, you will now find Chinese uh, authors. All does not go well necessarily with China's. Um, book uh, with its literature promotion efforts abroad. Take the Frankfurt Book Fair, probably the most significant event in the global um, literature calendar, certainly for publishers. Uh, it's one big uh, two week long um, uh, festival for uh, publishers. Uh, it attracts 300,000, last year's book fair in October 2009, China was the honored guest of the Frankfurt Book Fair. The organizers had been trying for more than 10 years to get the Chinese to agree to do this. Um, they finally did. Um, it attracted 300,000 visitors, 10,000 journalists, 7,300 exhibitors from more than 100 countries. But in the case of China, uh, they spent $7.5 million on the event, sent 2,000 publishers um, who exhibited nearly 10,000 uh, books. But there were a lot of problems behind the scenes. So it was on the one hand an effort, a time and an opportunity for the Chinese publishing industry and the state press and publishing administration, <laughs> uh, which engineered all this, um, to show Chinese writing and literature to the world. On the other hand, there were a lot of problems behind the scenes in the run up to the fair and during the fair, where the Chinese authorities that were involved we're trying to dictate the format, the topics, the speakers, the media coverage, and the participants of the fair. Um, and as I say, they had, they had they've walked out, in fact, of a couple of these events in the week's run-up to almost called off the whole thing at the end, um, but they went through with it. But it's an example of how China's heavy-handedness of the state is, tr is trying to intervene in the promotion of soft power in the pack, I should say maybe the packaging of soft power abroad. And they should just let it go, you know, and not try to overly control these um, events like the Frankfurt Book Fair. Book fair. Uh, after the Frankfurt Book Fair, one commentator in the magazine Global Times said that the Frankfurt Book Fair has, quote, given us a warning that cultural diplomacy is a war without bullets, unquote. So there's mixed uh, experiences here. Art, Chinese art, the, um, the, well China's art presence on the international art market is also growing um, rather dramatically in fact. Not only the global appetite for Chinese art, but, um, but the wealth that Chinese possess in purchasing Chinese art. In fact, um, the global art market saw a nearly 28 percent decline in auction sales over the last two years during the global financial downturn. And it would have been much worse had it not been for Chinese um, who are purchasing at auction. At Christie's, for example, in, in London and New York and Hong Kong, there's been a surge of wealthy private buyers. The Christie's annual spring auction this year, or sorry, 2010, um, Chinese buyers bought two-thirds of the objects on auction. 
Um, they are flush with cash and are outbidding by two to three times all others uh, who are bidding. Um, not just Chinese art, and the Chinese art they will buy and they want to return it to the so-called motherland, bring it home, um, but they're also purchasing foreign art, foreign uh, Western art and other, other art. Uh, they're getting very involved in the Maastricht uh, Annual Art Fair and others. I could give you more examples of this I'm quite interested in. And, um, actually, my wife works in this area as well. But for the sake of time, let me move on to another um, element of China's soft power, <coughs> film. Okay, Especially, you're, not, you're aware of this here in, in L.A., but, you know, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, House of Flying Daggers, um, uh, Yellow Earth, Judo, Farewell My Concubine, others. You have the world's leading expert on Chinese film sitting here, <laughs> Professor Rosen. He can tell you much better than I. But these are beginning to catch on in the, in the West and abroad. Um, and I don't know, Stanley, what you'd think, but to the degree to which they are agents or instruments of soft power promotion and of creating a favorable impression of China abroad. I would argue they, they are. How exactly? I'm not sophisticated enough to know. They're spending a lot of money because uh, they've flown there every year for the last few years to tell them how to internationalize the film market. So all this is If they succeed, I won't be flying back. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> film. Any country's soft power if you have soft power, has got to be anchored in substantial part education and research. That's been America's um, ace in the deck. It's been Britain's ace in the deck, France's ace in the deck. Is it China's ace in the deck? Well, the Chinese are certainly aware of this. There are several dimensions uh, to this question. First of all, Chinese students abroad. Second is foreign students in China. Third is the reputation of Chinese universities globally. Fourth is the quality of research and contributions of Chinese universities to global uh, research. <coughs> so again, without taking up too much time here, and I'm not sure, Clay, when you would like me to sort of stop and go to questions. Yeah? OK. Uh, trying to um, get started a little bit late. But um, OK, uh, Chinese students overseas. How many of you are students from China? There you go. <laughs> um, half the room. So that's a very good indication. Uh, since, uh, well, you are now, um, what, 40 of 110,000 Chinese students in the United States this academic year, Okay, by the way, which has gone up by 40,000 in the last two years alone. We'd been running at 60,000 for many years, ever since 1989, until the Americans finally relaxed their visa laws a couple years ago, and there has been a blip of 40,000 more just in the last two academic years. Uh, in, the UK, in, um, in the European Union, similar numbers, about, or sorry, um, many more, about 190,000 Chinese students now studying in the e EU, around 100,000 of those in the UK alone. Uh, so by far the largest number in the world, about 120,000 in Australia in this last academic year, 100,000 in Japan, um, 20,000 in South Korea, and lesser numbers elsewhere. Surprisingly, Chinese students are no longer the recipients of foreign scholarships, right? If I asked you, uh, or I, could, I won't embarrass you, but if I asked you 10 years ago, how many of you are receiving scholarships from USC or from some other foreign source, most of your hands would go up. Today, I bet very few of your hands would go up. You're all self-financed, right? Shows the amount of money uh, wash in Chinese society. It also shows the involvement of the so-called China Scholarship Council, a very important body that is underwriting not only Chinese students to go abroad, but foreign students to come to China, <coughs> including American students. So let's turn to that subject next. In the last academic year, there were a total of 220,393 foreign students studying in Chinese universities, uh, largely from Asia, uh, 152,000 of them from Asia, most of those uh, from Korea alone, about 60,000 from Korea, South Korea, um, 32,000 from Europe, 26,000 from the Americas, and so on. Um, so 
the numbers are growing. Actually, if you look at, I should have a graph on this, foreign student growth in China has been very steep in the last uh, four years or so uh, and is uh, continuing. Um, it's a revenue source uh, for the Chinese, but it also reflects people who want to learn the Chinese language, Chinese business uh, degrees, or increasingly in the case of students from developing countries, but also from Asian countries, they're going there for advanced degrees in the sciences uh, in particular. Not so much in the social sciences, not something China is strong in, or the humanities, um, and so on. So Chinese universities are, are getting better. Um, and schol oh, let me say one thing about scholarship schemes. This China Scholarship Council has recently um, allocated 10,000 scholarships for American students to go to China as part of the so-called 100,000 Strong initiative that President Obama um, has initiated during his last trip to China in November 2009. A classic unfunded mandate. He went over there, made a big speech in Shanghai, said, we're sending 100,000 American students to China over the next four years. He didn't say where, who's going to pay for it. Classic example. So he comes back, and the U.S. government is saddled with this unfunded mandate and is still trying to raise money, frankly, everywhere to pay for these students. But the Chinese Scholarship Council has chimed in and said, fine, we'll pay for 10,000 of them, <coughs> which is good. Okay. Um, world universe, uh, Chinese universities, where do they rank globally? Well, let's just say not at the top or near the top. In the, time, in the British Times Higher Education Supplement, which is one of, but one of the more important um, rankings, of global universities. Uh, the University of Hong Kong, which is part of China, ranks 24th. Tsinghua University ranks 49th, and Peking University ranks 52nd uh, globally. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, so they're cracked the top 50. I, I come from a university that's just trying to crack the top 50. George Washington, we're always sort of 49 or 50 or 51. <laughs> um, <coughs> but we're trying to get into the big leagues too. So China's universities are not, on a global basis, um, uh, you know, um, trendsetters, shall we say. Uh, but they're trying to. They recognize the need of it, and like everything else, they are just investing lots and lots of money in it, and they're doing it the same way that I just mentioned about soft power. Now, you can actually get return on investment more if you're putting it into universities, into labs, into classrooms, into faculty, and other uh, ways, um, and they're trying to build a handful of world-class universities, what they call the C9, the Core 9. They want to, over time, be up there to compete with the American Ivy Leagues. <coughs> uh, it'll take a while. And there are at least three reasons why I don't think they're ever going to get there. Uh, first is that China has not fostered a world-class research environment because of, the, of politics interfering in research, it's certainly in non-scientific research, but even in areas of science. Um, so it's very difficult to do basic science or basic research that goes beyond politically sent prescribed uh, boundaries. Um, secondly, there is still the tradition of rote learning and lack of critical learning uh, in the Chinese higher education. Um, it's not something that is rewarded. You know, it's not yet an essay-based system. You are not marked on your capacity to critique uh, an argument or a book. Uh, you are marked on your capacity to memorize it and feed it back verbatim. <laughs> the closer to the verbatim memorization, the higher your grade goes. You know, it's just the opposite of our system. This has roots deep into China's cultural past. Um, but until that is broken, um, and a f culture of, of uh, critical thought emerges, uh, at least the social sciences are never going to be internationally uh, competitive at all. And thirdly is that Chinese intellectuals, I find, are not very linked into global intellectual and professional networks or discourse in a number of fields. Now again, in the sciences, I think that's not the case. They are quite linked in. Um, lots of co-publishing, you know, and attendance to international conferences and articles in the major journals, but not in the humanities and the social sciences. 
Chinese intellectuals are not even part of the international discourse, I would submit, on the rise of China, the very issue that we are all consumed with and talk about and think about, at least people like me, all the time. It's not to say the Chinese don't discuss the rise of China, but they do so amongst themselves. It's a totally insular discourse in Chinese, for Chinese, in Chinese language <laughs> publications and electronic uh, media. So they're not part, they're not joining uh, this international discourse. You open up any major journal in international relations in the West, you will never find Chinese authored articles. Why? Because of the peer review process that is required. Uh, Chinese are afraid, actually I think there's a cultural explanation for it. It's not that Chinese can't get through the peer review process, they're afraid they can't get through it and therefore they will lose face. Diolian. If you lose face, it's the worst thing that can happen to you. You submit and then you're rejected. Well, Westerners, we say if you are rejected, then you go back to the drawing board, you take the three peer review critiques that you get and you rework your article and you resubmit it. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the way the Chinese social scientists think about this. So they tend not to submit, actually. I've got a study that was done by the Academy of Social Sciences on publication by Chinese in a whole series of Western journals, and the answer is literally none for some years, zero or two, maybe. So <clears throat> anyway, um, I think there's some problems when it comes to China's e education and research as a component of soft culture. Confucius Institutes, we talk about this subject, that's the example everybody uses. Do you have one here at USC? Nope. UCLA. UCLA has one? Okay. We don't have one either, but there are now f officially 282 worldwide, so-called 272 Confucius classrooms at the secondary level worldwide, uh, and growing all the time. Concentrated in the United States and Europe, but growing in other parts of the globe, Latin America, for example. <coughs> And their mission is uh, very similar to Alliance Francaise or the Goethe Institute, which is to teach culture and language. And it's a pretty pure mission. It's a good mission. They don't get into politics. They invest rather significant funds. $100,000 is the traditional startup amount, uh, which for a small college, if you're Lafayette College in southern Pennsylvania, that's a lot of dough. Um, 100,000 every year recurring, and it's not audited. I've interviewed the director of the Confucius Institute. She says, we can't, by law, we cannot go in and audit the expenditure of these funds in foreign sovereign countries. So I said, well, what do you do? She said, we just hope they spend it wisely. So um, it's, uh, it's a good thing. So they're not uh, pushing political agendas um, yet, and that's a good idea. Th one, one thing they're not doing, I'm surprised, is endowing programs and chairs in Chinese studies. I've been waiting for several years for this to happen, as the Taiwanese have been doing for years, you know, and other Japan and Korea. You know, when are we going to have the Deng Xiaoping chair in Chinese studies at USC, or the Hu Jintao chair in harmonious society <laughs> at UCLA, or the whatever? I don't know. Why they haven't gone down this path, I'm not sure, because they certainly have the money. Um, but if they did, they would find, I think, the same, they would have to learn the same lessons Taiwan learned uh, in trying to leverage donations for, poli for po political ends. So we'll have to watch that one. Um, here we have another example, maybe the best example of China's soft power, Yao Ming, um, and sports in general. Um, you know, Chinese athletics have really uh, achieved world-class level, excuse me, um, and the Chinese see it as a major element of being globally competitive and respected um, in the same way that the uh, Soviet Union did, East Germany did, other countries do. Um, they have invested enormous amounts here, and we saw the results at the last Olympic Games where they topped the gold medal table and came second in overall medals. Um, less, did, do less well in Winter Olympics, um, but they have a uh, number of professional athletes that have now entered the NBA. Yi Jing Lian is now playing for the Washington Wizards as well. They have for the first, the first player in the NFL, American professional football this year for the Cleveland Browns, a lineman named Ed Wong. Um, there are no <coughs> Chinese soccer players yet playing in the European Premier Leagues, but it's really a matter of time. 
They have a world-class hurdler in Liu Shang. They have a number of good Chinese tennis players. Li Na, I just heard in the radio last night, has made it through to the finals of the Australian she Open. She's upset the number one seed. Is she? Yeah, she upset the number one seed. Oh, she did? Yeah. Wow. Well, she's, she's great. So you have these um, athletes um, increasingly uh, having an impact. Okay, global brands, lastly. Um, I guess the point I want to make here is that there aren't many of them. China's really weak when it comes to global brands um, and global multinational corporations. Um, how many can you think of? Higher, uh, sort of white good producers, uh, Lenovo computers, which they bought out from IBM, Geely Automobiles, who just bought Volvo, um, Hisensei Televisions, Li Ning Sportswear, Qingdao Beer, there we all, we all know Qingdao Beer, absolutely. Uh, world-class brand, Air China, and so on. <clears throat> but if you look at the Fortune 500 list of uh, global multinational corporations, uh, China last year has only 22, sorry, 22 out of the top 500. And most of these are the big state-owned oil companies and banks. So you don't find real multinational corporations. In fact, I would say you don't find real multinational corporations in China. To be a multinational corporation implicitly means you have foreigners working in your organization, <laughs> right? Uh, particularly at high upper levels of management. You have governing bodies that oversee and regulate the uh, company. Transparency, you know, all kinds of things that uh, foreign multinationals do, the Chinese are, haven't done yet. So these are different uh, elements of China's global cultural footprint, if you will, and soft power. Uh, okay, let me uh, just try and do two more things before I close. One is to just tag for you the actors here. Who are we talking about in terms of promoting Chinese soft power? If uh, these examples I just gave you all come out of society, in effect, they're, they're not from the state. But who's involved at the state level? Most important of all, State Council Information Office, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Xinhua News Agency, China Central Television, China Radio International, which is pretty good, by the way, if you li listen to it, and their website's even better. A whole variety of publications, um, uh, exchange organizations, and foreign aid. So I just want to mention those, but and I have done a lot of research on them bureaucratically, but time uh, does not suffice. Let me just say that they are all, well, the, the media ones, the Xin, Xinhua, CCTV, CRI, and the uh, for what used to be called the Foreign Languages Press, which is now a kind of large jituan, I forget Stan what it's called, they've conglomeratized it. Yeah. Anyway, China National Publishing? Corporation. Under Zhou Mingwei, right? who's very savvy, he, he understands soft power. Uh, so they are all trying to broaden their footprint. I mentioned Xinhua having a new screen in Times Square. They're going to put these screens into shopping malls in Europe and the United States shortly. They're already in some European malls, right? And they're, streaming, they're, they're trying to compete head-to-head -head with uh, Western wire service agencies, Reuters, Bloomberg, UPI AP um, for straight news reporting. Uh, I've interviewed them. They, their goal is to make some money on this and to crack the West, what they call the Western monopoly on news. Um, and so they think that they can do straightforward descriptive reporting. Earthquake takes place here, coup d'etat takes place there, you know, whatever the event is without any kind of political spin or Chinese propaganda. So they, they have those goals. Um, uh, they are beefing up their bureaus abroad. They now have 400 correspondents posted in 117 bureaus around the world. Um, by next year, 2012, they expect to grow those to 180 bureaus. Um, and they are doing a number of other uh, things that I won't go into. CCTV um, airs in uh, several different languages, French, Spanish, Arabic, Russian, and English. Um, China Radio International broadcasts um, 59 languages, 
all over the world in different frequencies. And um, it's pretty good, actually. Their content is much improved. All of these, in fact, what, the, what they call the big four, Xinhua, CCTV, China Radio International, and China Daily newspaper, the big four, have all had complete uh, makeovers, facelifts, uh, more than a facelift, actually, a content lift <laughs> or a content revision in the last year. They're much more professional, much less staid and uh, propagandistic. China Daily has actually become readable, I think. And, and there's some very good information if on Chinese overseas investment, for example, you can find in China Daily. Okay, now, last, last point, uh, and I'll close. Okay, despite all these efforts, all this money, by the way, they're putting $8.7 billion into the big four uh, last year and this fiscal, over a two-year fiscal period, last and this year, $8.7 billion. It's not chump change. Um, so, despite all this effort, they continue to have mixed to poor image ratings abroad uh, that I talked about at the outset. And if you talk to many of the people who work in this system, they continue to complain about why we are misunderstood and, and, or, and disrespected. You hear these phrases, you know, you foreigners just don't understand us. You have bias and prejudice. You have Cold War thinking. Western discrimination. And it turns out, when you ask them, well, you know, let's talk about some of these areas. It turns out pretty quickly that if you disagree with China's official position on an issue, then you misunderstand, right? <laughs> so the equation of the Chinese government's position on anything, X, especially things like Tibet, human rights, Dalai Lama, anything sensitive, Uyghurs, if you just disagree with that, then you don't understand us. You know, because we, we have the correct understanding of this issue. And then they have what they call the four old myths and the three new theories. The four old myths are uh, that the West has applied to China are that the Soviet Union's today is tomorrow's China. In other words, that the West expects China and the Chinese Communist Party to implode and collapse like the Soviet Union did. The second is the so-called China threat theory, which China is a threat. That's been around for a long time they claim. Third is the China Collapse Theory that Westerners, particularly Gordon Zhang, published a book, uh, The Coming Collapse of China, but others too, that China is fragile and the again about to implode and break down. Um, but uh, then there are uh, the three new theories. Um, the China uh, Responsibility Theory, that China should be a globally responsible actor, Food Zarenda Dagwa. It should step up and shoulder its appropriate weight as a major power in world affairs, which they think is <coughs> inappropriate because they argue China is still a developing country. Um, it doesn't have uh, the resources or the means to contribute to global governance. And besides, global governance is a trap laid by the United States and the CIA uh, to hold China down, to re or to restrain China's rise. This time, by bleeding China internationally. I had a very senior member of the um, Chinese system this summer uh, tell me, David, in the 1980s, you Americans tried to subvert us politically. And that led to Tiananmen. In the 1990s and the early 2000s, he tried to contain us strategically in Asia. And you couldn't do that. Now, he said, beginning with the Robert Zellick responsible international stakeholder thesis, you are trying to bleed us internationally, tie us down out there in the world in far-flung places where we don't really have an interest, uh, but you tell us we should have an interest. And this is your latest attempt, you Americans, to restrain our rise. So the China responsibility and stake, China stakeholder theory, are they're deeply skeptical about. The last two theories, the Chimerica theory, the, which is a kind of G2, that the United States and China will establish a global condominium to basically rule the world. That was popular last year for a while. And the final theory that many Chinese argue is, is new is the so-called China arrogance theory, which came up during 2010, the past year, when China was being much more assertive and arrogant in Asia and towards the United States. So they reject um, th that, um, or they, they say that Western 
uh, media and governments have these biases and uh, prejudices. Prejudices. So uh, I don't really have time to go into this. I, I wanted to say a little bit about this soft power Chicago Council study on how China is viewed by its own neighbors. That Chicago Council study established a kind of soft power index. Uh, and, the, and the short of it is that China is not viewed very well by its own neighbors, with the exception of Vietnam and Indonesia. Um, okay, conclusion. Where, so what? Well, I would argue China actually has very limited soft power. Um, it has inept public diplomacy. It has enormous resources but no real strategy um, for promoting itself. Uh, the, as I say, the messenger can't sell the message if the message isn't sellable. Uh, they equate propaganda, external propaganda, Dui Wai Shenchuan, with, with soft power. And uh, perhaps, uh, but they do feel that there may be some more efficacy to their message in the developing world than in the Western world. So I'll leave it there. Um, it's still a work in progress in my own, uh, for my own book. But um, they've got a lot of resources. They're very frustrated. They want to increase and improve their image. Um, they can't understand why they aren't trusted and respected abroad. They're really bothered by it. Um, but I would say they should just look at that empty chair in Oslo and they will see some of the answer. Thank you very much. <laughs>